and that everything. Oh. Uh, thank you everyone uh, as you log on for joining us to kick off this uh, 2022 autumn quarter Michael M. Davis lecture series with us today. And in a moment, today's discussion moderator, Crown Family School for Social Work, Policy and Practice, Assistant Professor Ji Ying Ma will offer brief opening remarks and an introduction of today's presenter, Patrick Corrigan, Distinguished Professor of Psychology at the Illinois Institute of Technology. If you have questions during the presentation, please type the questions into the Zoom PNA pane or the chat function towards the end, end of the presentation. The chat function will be open for questions during a Q&A portion following the lecture. We will do our best to answer all questions after, after the discussion between Drs. Corrigan and Ma. A recording of this webinar will be available on the CHAZ website, chaz.uchicago.edu, as well as via the CHAZ YouTube channel by searching the Center for Health Administration Studies. And now, Assistant Professor Ji Ying Ma will introduce today's presenter. Thank you so much, Keith. Um, it's my great pl pleasure to um, open this Michael Davis series by um, introducing Dr. Patrick Cargan uh, uh, as the first presenter. So um, Professor Patrick Cargan is Distinguished Professor of Psychology at the Illinois Institute of Technology. Prior to that, Professor Cargan was Professor of Psychiatry and Executive Director of the University of Chicago Center for Psychiatric Rehabilitation. So there's definitely uh, some kind of homecoming feeling um, here to this le uh, today's lecture. So Professor Cargan has worked most of his 30 year career in providing and evaluating services for people with psychiatric disabilities with special focus on the impact of health equity. Realizing that the benefits of psychiatric services are limited by stigma, he has spent the past two decades broadening his research to the prejudice and discrimination of mental illnesses. His work has been supported by NIH and PCORI for most of the time to, among other things, develop and lead the National Consortium on Stigma and Empowerment. This led to development of the Honest, Open, Proud program to erase the stigma of mental illness. Professor Corrigan also extended his research to mental health and social determinants, such as ethnicity, religion, gender identity, sexual orientation, and age, and corresponding social disadvantage related to poverty, criminal justice involvement, and immigration concerns resulting in the Chicago Health Disparities Center. Professor Corrigan has authored more than 450 journal articles and 20 books. He is also um, editor of the Stigma and Health, an APA journal. So without further ado, let's welcome Professor Targan to give um, his presentation today um, titled Beating the Stigma of Substance Use Disorder. Thank you. Thank you, Ji Ying. Thank you all for having me. Uh, when I was at U of C, I was actually adjunct faculty in what was then called SSA um, on a, a project. And so it's uh, good to be back even in this limited form. Um, I wanna talk to you today about um, the stigma of substance use disorder and more importantly, how to fix it. Um, let me put it in perspective. For much of my career, I've been focusing on serious mental illness. And so we know what the stigma of serious mental illness is, is showing people as in disrespectful images as being schizo in particular in terms of being dangerous. Uh, for a reason I'll share with you in a minute, about seven years, we brought it in, uh, into the stigma of substance use disorder. And so what I hope to do today is to help understand the stigma broadly of behavioral health um, and more specifically on substance use disorder and use what we know from the mental health side to describe the special challenges of stigma of substance use disorder and perhaps begin to chat with you about how to beat it. So again, the goal is not just to describe it, not by a long shot, the advocate's priority is to fix it, both in terms of mental health and in terms of substance use disorder. And so I speak to you today um, as researchers, um, and some of you might wear the hat of providers, and most importantly, I would speak to people as advocates, especially people with lived experience. And so SAMHSA um, described this idea of behavioral health um, it's their way of referring to mental illness and substance use disorder. In about 2015, the National Academy of Science convened a panel 
to get together and talk about the stigma uh, of mental illness and substance use disorder. It produced this report, which came out a couple of years um, later. And one of the things we found is that the, the uh, stigma of substance use disorder is significantly worse than the stigma of mental illness. Now, I say that very hesitantly because I don't like it when people say one stigma is worse than the other or stigma in India is worse than stigma in the West because it kind of diminishes the experience people have. But I hope to share with you the stigma of substance use disorder offers a special challenge. And the other thing we found out is the research on the stigma of substance use disorder is almost gone, almost absent. And so we wrote a paper in American Journal of Addictions that came out in 2016 applying what we know from the mental health side to being able to understand the stigma of addictions and then be able to reduce it. And so again, my goal is to cherry pick from that different ways of understanding substance use disorder stigma and fix it. What is stigma? Sam Keynes, a sociologist who wrote a book called Faces of the Enemy, and I think he helps us put it in perspective. It's how groups in power, unfortunately too often white males, that disrespected other groups using media images, perhaps one of the worst in our history is what the white majority has done um, in terms of the blacks, in terms of African-Americans. Um, this says scientists say Negro still an ape stage. Um, I choose to show this horrible message first to remind us the stigma of mental illness and substance use disorders in the same category as racism and sexism and ageism. And second, this came from an 1890s medical textbook. And so what we perpetuate is stigma. And what one half the population has done to the other half, so the harder a wife works, the cuter she looks. We're of course more interested in stigma and mental health. We see it in the movies. Um, this is Freddy Krueger from Nightmare on Elm Street, the, cinema, the most popular cinematic maniac since Darth Vader, or Jason from Friday the 13th. I like this. I'm not sure if anybody um, ever watches the show Shameless. I sort of figured it out. They're actually physically located somewhere between me and Bronzeville and you and Hyde Park. And it's a story about the silly adventures of their alcoholic substance abusing father, who unfortunately is not always a joke. His habits really become quite significant. You see in the news page, news media, Freed mental patient kills mom or get the violent crazies off of our streets. Now, these are tabloids. This is what they're supposed to do. It's not right, but this is how you get your intention when you're in a supermarket. This actually comes from the reader. I think most Chicagoans know the reader. It's a pretty um, well-respected weekly. Um, in this story, uh, the gentleman on the left, you know, drug-induced psychosis killed his wife was found not guilty by reason of insanity and sent to Elgin, which is a forensic hospital at the time. Um, about 10 years later, everybody thought he was ready to return to the community. Ted Klein wrote a pretty balanced story, but the editor put this headline on here and kept him in even longer. Unfortunately, the narrative of the news media for substance use disorders frequently wound up with the war on drugs with images of um, drug hoodlums and of overarmed police trying to manage with. We see it in advertising. This offer could get you committed. Crazy Eddie's record of asylum. To offer these deals, you have to be committed or maniac out of control. Now, sometimes people will say to me, you know, shouldn't you just lighten up? I mean, aren't we being a little overly politically correct? Well, at one time, this might have been funny. The chef does everything but cook. That's what buys are for. Um, just as you realize that's inappropriate. So this won the Clio Award, which is the Academy Award of Advertising some years back. It's a straitjacket filled with nuts. Is it better? Um, I've been doing this lecture for a while. Um, since then, um, to put this in perspective, you're looking at a printing company in downstate Ohio. Pretend the woman's not there. You see two legs coming down uh, uh, a... Uh, chair tipped over a bottle of booze on its side and notes saying contemplating suicide, get your notes printed here. Um, if that's not a bad enough, they try to explain to her why that's a concern. She didn't understand the big deal. Or this, even this is getting a little old now. Many of you might remember John Nash, the Nobel laureate. Um, this is where um, 
Mr. Nash would go and his schizophrenia relapse. They had a fire in 2002. Nobody was hurt. But the next day, the headline said roasted nuts. If that's not. So what does the research show? Um, Bruce Link and, and Joe Phelan working with um, NORC collected data in 1996 and compared it to the 1956 to Shirley Star data on the degree to which the public thought people with mental illness are dangerous. Um, I'd be glad to sidebar with you. Generally, the literature shows that they're much more likely to be victims of mental illness than perpetrators, which you would hope from 1956 to 1996, because we know so much about mental illness that we could have, that actually went in the other direction. And they followed up in 2006, and it's just as bad. You know, we're post hocing the data, and of course, post hocing data always has problems, but the post hoc the data, we're probably thinking this is the degree to which we have these god awful shootings in the United States every time we tie it to mental illness leads to this idea that people with mental illness are homicidal maniacs. And actually a colleague, Tony Jorm in Australia did a study that showed the stigma of schizophrenia in Australia went up after these kind of events. And so how do we understand stigma? Um, this is my one um, attempt to, to describe what stigma is in one matrix. Um, we talk about the structures of stigma, the stereotypes, prejudice, and discrimination. Um, an ethnic group I know a little bit about in terms of stereotypes is that all Irish Americans are drunks and neglect their families. Uh, stereotypes are unavoidable. If you live in a society, you learn it. Um, prejudice is agreeing with it. Yep, that's right. They're drunks and discrimination is a behavior. And so, of course, what we're much more interested in is the stereotypes, prejudice, and discrimination first about mental illness. The stereotype is that they're dangerous, but perhaps also that they're weak or chose to be this. Prejudice leads to feelings like I'm afraid of them or they should be ashamed of themselves. And the discrimination is don't hire them. We'll come back to this in a minute. But we did a study in 2017 trying to figure out what the stereotypes, prejudice, discrimination are, substance use disorder. There's a tremendous amount of overlap between the two of them, especially in terms of dangerousness. But the two things that tend to arise in substance use disorders are more amoral and criminal. And so it leads to a bit of a more defensive and hostile reaction to them. Let's talk about how they actually show themselves. So there's three different types of stigma. Public stigma is what happens when we, the public, agree with the stereotype and apply it to people. And so there's evidence that their ability to get a job or get accommodations on the job is decreased, or the housing's worse, or education programs aren't appropriately supportive, or legislature won't fund them, or faith communities fall short, or it leads to this inappropriate idea of coercive treatment. Uh, ben Druss, who's now in Emory, perhaps did one of the most compelling studies of this that came out in 2000. He looked at about 40,000 charts of veterans who presented to their primary care doc um, with shortness of breath, rapid heartbeat, and such that they needed to be referred to uh, for PTCA or more, they needed to be referred to a cardiologist. 100% of the time, if they showed those symptoms, there's no evidence of mental illness or substance abuse, they got referred. It went down to 80% of the time when the doctor thought the veteran had a substance abuse problem and it went down to 40% of the time when they thought they had a mental illness. Now there's a couple of things about this. One is that uh, mental illness, a, a stigma is not this sort of a politically correct agenda items that's really not important. This is a matter of life and death. And two, this is physicians doing this. Self-stigma. Self-stigma is what happens when a person with mental illness internalizes a negative stigma and applies it against themselves. Um, it leads to this feeling of I'm not worthy or I'm not able and ends up with the why try effect. Now, my job as a rehab psychologist is to help people get back to work or live in alone or find a significant other or get through school. The why try effect is something you can say, I'm not worthy to get a job or I'm not able to live alone. And so self-stigma undermines those goals. Finally, is the idea of label avoidance. Stigma is essentially a mark. Um, Stigma and race, the mark is obvious as it is in gender, as it is in age, race is skin color, um, gender is body features, um, um, age is gray hair. 
the stigma of mental illness is fundamentally hidden. And the way you get the stigma of mental illness is you get seen coming out of a doctor's office or you get seen taking psych meds. And that's the degree to which people will want to avoid the label. And so they won't want to seek out care. And so generally, there's huge evidence that people with serious mental illness, regardless of the diagnosis, will, will not seek out care when they can. And so all this work pretty much reflects our, our years of doing work on mental illness stigma. Um, soon after the National Academy of Science paper, we started doing a deep dive into what are the differences between mental illness and substance use stigma. And there are a lot, but the two we're really interested in is both the criminal and the civil uh, issues. In terms of criminal, I don't have to tell you, there's laws about age and alcohol, um, drug use, driving under the influence. It can go even higher to uh, possession or sales. Uh, in fact, um, our own President Nixon codified this whole thing and probably did one of the more damning things in terms of stigma and call, coming up with a war on drugs. On the civil side, um, substance use and mental illness are mitigators in lawsuits. For example, in family law, you can bring it up. Usually mental illness is losing ground as a mitigator in lawsuits, but substance use disorder is still prominent. And what's really interesting is disability protections. While it's, it's clearly a uh, prescription against not hiring somebody because they have a serious mental illness or not providing them reasonable accommodations, um, it's apparent that if you relapse with a substance use disorder, you're no longer protected by the ADA. Also, it's socially sanctioned. Perhaps in most recent years, Rodrigo Duterte is the best example of this, really criminalizing um, substance use disorder to the point of proposing murder. Unfortunately, there are people in our history who apply to this side of the Atlantic. So we know what stigma is. The goal is how to stop it. I want to start with some of the unintended effects of stopping stigma. One is that stigma is fundamentally a social justice issue, not an issue of psychiatry or biology. And because it's a social justice issue, we have proud examples in American history of dealing with social justice like this is um, Dr. King coming across the Pettus Bridge into Selma, Alabama, or what we've made light year steps in is a gay and lesbian movement. And even disabilities has its examples of, of champions. Um, in the lower right-hand corner, the cowboy has Justin Dart. Um, he's frequently considered the Martin Luther King Jr. of the ADA. The problem with it being social justice, and I say that carefully, the problem with it being social justice is it speaks to us as progressives. And as progressives, we all want to want in and fix it. Now, don't let me, don't get me wrong. Fixing stigma, I think, is amongst the handfuls of public mental health agendas. But running in leads to mistakes. And one good mistake of running in and making things worse is, you know, before Bill Clinton was president, the military had an active agenda of identifying and, and pushing out gay soldiers. And so he came up with the idea, he didn't come up with his. Um, time came up with the idea of don't ask, don't tell. If you don't tell us you're gay, we won't ask. The problem with that whole idea is it led to closetedness. And there's some pretty good uh, um, data that suggests it might have made things even worse. So it took until um, Barack Obama came along to repeal that sort of thing. So let me give you some more apparent examples of unattended consequences for stigma change, those that don't work. One is the easy one. You want to just change the stigma, just change the words. Uh, this is a model of what we think the different ways are of changing public stigma. And protest um, is the way, is this call for changing the words to stop talking that way. It makes sense because you may know leprosy is now Hansen's disorder and dementia is Alzheimer's. And actually, by act of federal legislation, mental retardation, intellectual disability, they went and stripped out MR. Many has bipolar disorder, um, and there's a big push for calling addiction and substance abuse a substance use disorder. And some people have actually changed the words. Um, Japan for mental illness is going from Seishun Banetsu Bio to Togo Shitko Shou, which translates from mind split disease to integration disorder, which from the Japanese perspective um, is less disrespectful. And Koreans have done it, and Hong Kong. 
um, and Singapore. And this provides a ready example to do a study and see what kind of impact it has on people. What is it? What does it actually happen when you change the words? Similarly, this whole push of going from addiction to substance use disorder. Um, Salvia did a, a study some years back. Um, by the way, sidebar, um, you know, lots of people have a problem with the word schizophrenia, probably partly because it has a schiz in it, which suggests split and is really derogatory in its own right. And so just as we erase the stigma of dementia by calling it Alzheimer's disorder, so there's a some call for decreasing the stigma of schizophrenia by calling it Bloiler's syndrome. Bloiler was the um, Swiss psychiatrist who came up with the original format for what um, schizophrenia is. They've looked at the research and they looked at what kind of impact it has on the general population and then on providers. On a general population change, the words almost has no impact. I don't care what you call it, schizophrenia, boilers disorder, or psychosis, they're nuts and they're dangerous and I'm gonna stay away from it. The reason why we think language change matters so much is because when things like the DSM-5 came out, um, as you all know, we're actually up to DSM-5 TR. And for example, we cured autism, we cured Asperger's disorder because we stripped out Asperger's disorder with DSM-5 and now call it autism spectrum. The issue is when the new words come out, we learn them fast. And we learn them fast so we can teach our psychopathology course, but probably even more so we can get paid by um, insurance. So changing the words does not seem to work as well. Another point is education. Is education is where we really began our work. I mean, everybody on the call today are big in education. We spend years um, getting educated. We spend years doing it. We sort of feel like providing people information is a way to, to change the status quo. They've actually done some research on what kind of impact education has on some pop, uh, prominent um, public mental health issues. One was DARE. Um, you all probably know DARE. Either you were in it, your kids were in it. Um, at one point, it was in 75% of US school districts in 43 countries. The good news is this, oh, and in case you weren't in it, generally it was a police officer showing paraphernalia and the risks of drug use and really the idea of trying to decrease drug use. Um, this is a case where the feds actually paid for five RCTs on it. Um, three RCTs showed no effect. One done at RTI was unclear and one had significant effects. Um, people who went through DARE were significantly more likely to use drugs and alcohol and follow up. So in terms of this case, education seemed to have a rebound effect. Perhaps a more recent one, given we're coming out of the, well, we're, we may be coming out of the pandemic and vaccinations. This slide actually comes from before that. You know, there's a slew of people who believe that autism is caused by vaccines, which is a major public health concern because there are some childhood disorders which actually might be going up um, in frequency as a result. So they do research. Uh, they'll do research where they show parents who sort of support this idea of vaccines are bad news. They show them fact sheets from the CDC and they show them compelling stories of what happens to a little girl in this case who gets it. And Nyan and all did a series of studies and actually this is one of uh, several studies who shows that this is just parents who believe vaccines cause autism. There is no change from pre to post in their attitudes. And there's actually a significant decrease in the degree to which they believe um, that vaccination, that they, they agree with the, the intention of vaccinating their children. So we're much more interested in this case of what education does to um, mental illness. Uh, uh, George Walker Bush launched the Decade of the Brain in 1990, had many purposes to it, but one is if we taught Americans that mental illness is a brain disorder, maybe we decrease this uh, stigma. This is actually a PET scan with the occipital lobes in the back lit up, suggesting this guy is seeing things. And we believed from the beginning, in fact, one of our first studies was that this would decrease blame on people. You know, if you saw that it, it's, a, it's um, a brain disorder, you're not gonna blame them for it. And pretty much our research showed that. But our research also showed you're not gonna think they're recover. It's hardwired in, prognosis sucks. 
I don't care how you look, you're not going to do well. And this belief that they're not going to recover leads to uh, employers who don't want to hire them and landlords who don't want to rent to them and healthcare providers who offer substandard care. Contact, uh, I'm Gordon Allport, who's a social psychologist, perhaps best gave voice to the contact hypothesis, believing that, now well, we have a long way to go, believing that attitudes between blacks and whites um, diminished the degree to which blacks and whites had interactions with each other as peers. And so we borrowed the idea of the contact hypothesis. Um, this is Bob Lundin, who worked with me at U of C for about eight years. Um, he's a person with schizoaffective disorder. Um, we would do contact where you get to meet Bob and hear his story. Um, this is a formula. We came up with it. Hi, my name is Bob. One of the fastest ways to get the stigma applied to you is to throw the label up. Um, in his part, he has schizoaffective disorder. Um, his childhood was not unusual. He wanted to debunk the idea that people with mental illness stigma are born broken. Um, but his mental illness was traumatic. Here's the problem. When you meet Bob, you go, for real? Something like you've got a mental illness and I don't believe it. Um, in Bob's case, he was hospitalized more than a dozen times. he get in trouble with the law when he get manic. He used and abused substances. And despite that, he achieved. Um, Bob just retired from a 10-year career at DuPage County Mental Health, where he was a peer support provider. And so we did a meta-analysis some years back where we compared effect sizes on the impact of education, having an expert tell you about the facts versus the myths of mental illness, and contact, meet Bob Lundin. And they all led to significant positive effects. Um, the effect size due to contact was two to three times bigger. Um, these were pre-post. Uh, we also, I don't have it here. We also have a slide we published separately in psych services showing follow-up. Follow-up generally the blue, the uh, education effect went almost back to zero as a contact effect maintained over time. So as a result in 2011, we re released this model of how we think the best way to change contact is. I'm sorry, the best way to change stigma is, is targeted, local, credible, continuous contact. You notice it all rests on contact. People with lived experience need to be telling their stories with, for each other. I'm a huge believer in LGBTQ rights. I am a straight male. I can be a huge ally to them, but the story needs to come from people with lived experience. It needs to be targeted local, credible, and continuous. Targeted, I'd like to erase stigma tomorrow, but if you wanna be more effective, you should target the stigma in landlords who are more likely to hire people, or I'm sorry, in employees who are more likely to hire people or landlords to rent to them or primary care providers. Local, um, if you're gonna do a program in Peoria, it needs to be done by Peorians. Um, Chicagoans have their own style of things, Different countries have their own view and you have to adopt it for that place. Credible, continuous contact. It leads to what we would believe is the grand plan for changing stigma. Again, it is somewhat borrowed from my historical understanding of the LGBTQ world, is that the way we change the stigma of LGBTQ is people coming out. That in 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, brave men and women came out and told their story of their life of LGBTQ. So I think the grand plan also applies in terms of mental illness, a whole slogan of coming out mad or coming out proud. Um, there is a mad pride is a group in California in which is meant to directly address this thing. It's what's there to be shameful of. This is who I am. And so a lot of famous people have come out. I'm Rod Steiger, won the Academy Award for In the Dark of in the dead of night, in the dark of the night, um, with a bipolar disorder, Patty Duke, who has bipolar disorder, Mike Wallace from 60 Minutes was on, um, has a, a severe depression. I like showing this slide to people in the top row because my students say, who are these people? And so Demi Lovato is out talking about her story and affective disorders, as is um, Jim Carrey, and Leonardo DiCaprio actually struggles with um, anxiety. <clears throat> 
famous people coming out is a good start, but there's a limitation to their effect. It's what we would call the third Gordon Marshall effect. As you know, he's the first black Supreme Court justice and when he was appointed by Lyndon Johnson in the 60s, progressive people said this will really change white attitudes about blacks. They'll look at him, the distinguished person with a distinguished career, and they'll say how cool he is, and that will generalize the blacks. But it doesn't tend to work that way. We tend to compartmentalize. We tend to say Thurgood Marshall's not like other black people. Or this is uh, James John Nash, um, the Nobel laureate who was in It's a Beautiful Mind. And we say he's not like other people with mental illness. And so we wrote a book that was published a few years ago called Coming Out Proud, the Racist Stigma of Mental Illness. Um, it's 42 stories of people around the world talking about their stories of recovery, and more importantly, the demand for solidarity. Um, their message is they're not wanting to pass as normal. Their message is this is who I am and the expectation that you will stand with me. And this led to the Honest, Open, Proud program that Xi Ying talked about. Um, this is a program we developed about 12 years ago um, with people with lived experience. It has three lessons to it. Um, the first lesson is consider the pros and cons of disclosing, which by the way, vary depending on whether you're talking about coming out at work versus at home versus your faith-based community. Um, the second is there's different ways to disclose. So Xi Ying seems to be a nice person. I could take her to Starbucks and I say, hey, did you see Silver Linings Playbook? What'd you think? And if she says, I'm sick and tired of Hollywood showing those crazy people as normal, she's probably not a good person for me to come out to. And thirdly, it's your story crafted the way you want. Um, it's done, led by two facilitators with lived experience, um, usually in a group of about six peers. And there's a booster, a follow-up, come back two months later and say, how'd it go? Um, at this point, it has five peer-reviewed RCTs in it, showing its effect on stigma, stress, um, self-esteem, and um, depression. In fact, Russian Custers last year wrote a meta-analysis on it, um, showing its effect. So I want to stop a minute and think out loud with you and perhaps generate some questions or comments from you going forward. Because again, substance use disorder is more of a new arena for me. And I'm wondering if contact is the secret for changing the stigma of mental illness, people coming out proud, people saying this is part of my identity, it's not something I'm going to hide, does it work in the substance use side? And so lots of famous people have come out in the substance use side. Demi Lovato is not only out about her mental illness, but also about her opiate use, as is um, um, Elton John talking about his troubles and Ben Affleck and uh, boy. Uh, Iron Man um, and Daniel Radcliffe. I mean, they're all out. Their stories are a little bit different than the stories in Hop. The stories in Hop is this is who I am. I've had some tough times, but I've recovered. That's a little bit different. The stories these people say is consistent with the 12 step idea that you've been on your way down and you're kind of broken. And the solution is to admit you need help. It sort of leads to the idea of, is there pride in substance use disorder? We used to say the number one goal of having mental illness is to get out of that group. It's a bad group, it's a disrespected group, you should get out of it. Many people now realize that's part of people's identity they choose to embrace, and so we need to support that too. It's who they are authentically. Does that work on the substance use side? I think one way we've begun to look at it is in terms of the idea of recovery, the idea of recovery and mental illness and the idea of recovery and substance use disorder. And they both produce two factor models that our research shows the public really understands in different ways. Um, first, the idea of people with mental illness and recovery, this is pretty much what SAMHSA says. They distinguish recovery as an outcome in fact, long-term follow-up research on schizophrenia will show the outcomes are much more benign than um, any psychiatrist ever thought. A lot of people, their, their symptoms will remit entirely. Um, but also, recovery can be a process, and it lays on what we would call the despite pivot. Despite having a mental illness, you can pursue your goals and your hope. Despite being in a wheelchair, 
you can go to law school or get a PhD in social work or go to medical school. Um, the idea is for the person in a wheelchair, success is based on a degree to which the community rises up, changes its standards and accepts people. And so it's the same thing with um, uh, mental illness. In this case, the process is much more consistent with the way uh, people at SAMHSA in the world view recovery and mental illness. It's a process by which people um, can pursue their goals. It seems different to me. And again, I'm a little hesitant here because I'm, I don't have a deep dive into the substance use community. But outcome for substance abuse seems to be the idea of abstinence. That you really kick this whole thing when you stop it. And process is more the idea of harm reduction, the idea of learning how to live with it. In this case, harm reduction is not viewed as a step towards abstinence, but an end point in itself. Some people want to keep using cocaine or using alcohol and need to learn ways to do it to be safer. So what does this have to do with coming out in a story you have to tell? Well, in terms of coming out from the, at the outcome side, the message is fundamentally, we need to be abstinence. And those five Hollywood figures I showed you is pretty much the story they're telling. As opposed, and that leads to the idea of perseverance. What you heard from Daniel Radcliffe and Demi Lovato and Elton John was I had these huge challenges with help, frequently 12-step programs, I persevered. The process side, though, is much more this idea of harm reduction, despite having a substance use disease, learning how to live with it. This is part of my identity and having pride in it. The recovery model on the mental health illness side is really quite prominent. Um, the idea that it's a process and you should be hopeful and optimistic and go forward is really quite prominent. I think the coming outside, I, I know there's many proponents of harm reduction. I still think it's a foreign case to sell to people from the community. And there is a group called Faces and Voices of Recovery, which I've worked with in the past, which is much more supportive of this idea of being out and being proud and saying this is who you are. Um, but it seems to me to be a bit more of a foreign idea. Um, leads to what really makes this difficult is the idea of intersectionality, a uh, spell would have known. The idea of intersectionality, the original idea of intersectionality came out when gender studies and, and black studies merged. And they asked themselves, is being a black woman just being black, being a woman, or the sum of them both? And the problem is the sum of the both is not a simple math exercise. It's frequently probably a unique interaction, not only for the community of Black women in general, but also for individual Black women. And in substance use disorder, the intersections are even more compelling and, and the like. There's the issue of people with substance use disorder also having mental illness or being from um, a diversity, equity, inclusion group. Um, or poverty or incarceration. In fact, we did Honest Open Proud um, at the county jail some years back. Um, the county jail, they take inmates who are there with a mental health concern and put them in different colored clothes so everybody can see them. And we put them in a segregated unit and did Honest Open Proud. And they said, this is really great, but look, doc, you know, I'm not only struggling with coming out with a mental illness, but I have a substance use problem and I have HIV AIDS. I got to tell everybody else I was in jail. And so the stigma of the intersection and dealing with it is even more compellingly difficult. So I speak to you today as scientists and look forward to questions in terms of the science of it. Um, but I also speak to you as advocates. This is, of course, one of the greatest examples, heroes in American history of advocates, Martin Luther King Jr., who made great strides in terms of uh, racial equity. On the mental health side has the same thing. This is Clifford Beers, who was in a psychiatric hospital in Connecticut um, at the break of the 20th century. He later came along and started the mental hygiene movement, which morphed into Mental Health America. And he said in 1909, think about this, this is 1909. He said, I must fight in the open. He realized he needed to come out and deal with things.
And so I like to end with a prayer from Gandhi, who is another hero of social justice in our time, who said, let our first act every morning be to make the following resolve for the day. I shall not fear anyone on earth. I shall fear only God. I shall not bear ill will towards anyone. I shall not submit injustice from anyone. I shall conquer untruth by truth. And in resisting untruth, I shall put up with all suffering. What he said for India applies for the challenge we have in front of us. Um, this is me. Don't hesitate to email. I do this as an avocation. Um, we'll get back to you soon. Thank you. I'll turn this back to Ji Yang. Thank you so much, Dr. Cor uh, Corrigan, for this great talk. And um, I think there is already a question, so I'm going to ask that while um, also waiting for other questions. I have uh, tons of questions and curiosities myself, but I'll uh, try to insert them um, when uh, there's there there's period of like um, silence. So um, we have a guest, um, Davis, David Ennis, who asks, how do you measure the level of stigma? So um, if you go to ncse1.org, our website, we actually have a toolkit. Um, there are several different measures. It depends whether you're measuring self-stigma or public stigma. Um, public stigma, remember, is a set of attitudes. Uh, it's, it, the attitudes are embo em uh, embodied in stereotypes. Um, we have a model looking at stereotypes related, related to blame and shame, shame and dangerousness. And so it's a seven point scale um, that we've been using called the attribution scale, which has a lot of legs to it. Self stigma, we have a self stigma measure. Um, the self stigma measure is actually based on a regressive model, based on a regression stage model, making things worse. So it's based on, on um, are you aware of the stigma of mental illness? All people are dangerous. Do you agree with it? Yep, they're all dangerous. Do you apply it to yourself? I'm mentally ill, I must be dangerous. And you're harmed by that. And therefore I think I'm less than anybody else. Um, if you go to the website, you can download it or email me and have somebody send it to you. Great, thank you. And next we have a question from um, Hagen Black um, who asks, how can we lessen behavioral health stigma in professional white collar careers? One more time. How can we lessen, uh, it's also in the chat. How can we lessen behavioral health stigma in professional white collar careers? How can you lessen stigma that white collar professionals experience? Mm -hmm. I think so. Or um, Keith, is, uh, do, do, does the audience, um, uh, are they able to unmute themselves and uh, chime in? I can unmute them if uh, he wants to raise his hand, him or her, and uh, I can unmute their microphone. Yeah, I don't know if that person wants to say more or... Well, let me take a stab at it, and then they can <laughs> clarify. Um, there's a lot of um, anti-stigma programs um, at many different levels facing many different communities. The uh, Chamber of Commerce, the National Chamber of Commerce has a group whose name escapes me, whose particular job is to look at the stigma in work settings. Um, and that tends to be dominated on white collar sort of things. And so we've attempted doing honest, open, proud and white collar settings. Uh, we don't have big enough data set to know what kind of impact it has. Um, you see more and more um, prominent CEOs coming out with their own mental health challenges. So I think the degree to which people are out and that's okay um, in the long term will probably have an impact. In the shorter term, um, education programs might help, though I really caution in the education programs because it can be no more than a band-aid that really doesn't last very long. And, um, and that's sort of one of my questions. And that is, can you expand on like why um, or why the, the education programs typically don't work or don't work to their full ex extent? We know the result um, uh, from what you've shown us, but what is the kind of uh, intermediary process that explains that? Well, of course, you're asking me to postdoc the data, and I tend to be uh, a Republican about doing that. But of course, mm -hmm. postdoc, my best guess is that, does, is that whatever benefit has does not endure. And the reason it does not endure compared to 
the compelling nature of meeting somebody who then they and their peers will always be there is that the impact of the knowledge just doesn't stick over time. Mm -hmm. um, that's pretty much seen in research on most discriminated against groups. So the social psych research that goes back decades on trying to change white attitudes about blacks didn't really work very well in education. It was a degree to which they interacted as peers. Okay, thank you. And um, so that, that seems to be a kind of uh, stickiness or not. And my next question kind of ties to um, the cultural uh, differences of um, disclosure and this, uh, including honest, open and proud. Um, so working in the field of mental health and disability rights, I, al I mean, I always have this suspicion that um, a lot of the discourses that we have seen in the United States are tied to the kind of um, uh, culture of individualism, including the, the kind of uh, uh, discourse on pride, right? Mad pride or other kinds of pride. So I always wondered whether um, disclosure as a form and this, uh, and contact based on disclosure as a measure to reduce st stigma. My work as well in uh, in culture that is not based on individualism. I know that you uh, and your team have recently done some studies of uh, adapting uh, hop to other cultures. Um, so I wondered um, about your thoughts on the kind of um, cross cultural ap applicability of uh, this program or other disclosure um, uh, and contact programs and, um, and what your thoughts in general about, uh, uh, about this. Um, amen. Uh, you, you and I have talked about this. Um, I entirely agree with it. Uh, mm -hmm. I go back to my slide that this is not a, a medical biological phenomenon. Um, this is a social construct. And so the way a, an ethnic group or a social group interprets this is going to have a big impact. Um, so one of my uh, cross the board research questions is how does disclosure work in your mm -hmm. culture? And we're adapting it in Pakistan right now. I'm in Saudi Arabia. But the thing you refer to is we adapted it for Chengdu, China. And it's a very labor intensive community based participatory research process. I mean, the one problem with us working in China is I speak, we speak absolutely no Mandarin. I'm not sure we have to, um, but we're definitely at the sidelines. And in doing community based participatory research, we give them the program, start broad with a discussion of stigma, and then encourage them to take it apart in any way. Uh, my favorite anecdote is when they got all done. Um, you're right. Um, I'm honest and proud of a very individualist thing. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more. It's a very collectivist thing and how you work in cultures. And their big response is, well, this is okay, but where's mom and dad and the whole thing? And so there was this real need. And you know, one part of me, the Western part of me says, you know, it's not up to mom and dad, um, but the in, in appreciating and respecting Chinese, that becomes a big issue. So we worked with them and they adapted it. Um, they came up with sort of a, a hop side, uh, hop alley to go into the issue to mom and dad too. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I look forward to learn, learning more about that um, hop alley program. And, um, and so our next question comes from uh, Professor Harold Pollack. And Harold, do you want to ask, uh, ask a question yourself? Or Keith, are, are we able to do that? Uh, yes, can you yes, hear me now? Yes, he's, yep. he's. So I, I, the self-stigma concept has, I, I'm, I, I struggle with one aspect of it. Uh, so suppose someone has a substance use disorder and they've done certain things as, that are connected to that disorder. Maybe they drove intoxicated or they committed a survival crime. And, and they're, how do you distinguish someone taking responsibility for or making amends for something that some concrete thing that they did and saying, you know, I, I really had this problem while I had my substance use disorder that was affecting other people from the, from a self stigma that is harmful to the individual and, and and should be and needs to be addressed. It seems to me there's a tension there. That there's, uh, if you think about the traditional twelve step journey, you know, making amends is a key concept in it. And and there and how, how do you how do you think about that uh, um, sort of the tension in that? Yeah, I think that's a great point. 
Um, I think we would take it back to the issue of identity is despite the mistakes you've made um, as a person, do you think there's some value in it? Um, I think the example on the mental health side is people with mania who do unfortunate things, whether they're manic or people with schizophrenia who similarly do stuff, is despite that, there's some worth in the person itself. And that's the part you want to come out and say, this is who I am, using substances as part of that. Thank you. I think, by the way, the other interesting thing, and we wrote a paper some years back, is self-stigma is fundamentally low self-esteem and shame, which is really a bugger on the mental health side when you're looking at depression, mm -hmm. right? Because people are depressed frequently show that kind of stuff over time. Um, perhaps to us, one of the ways to discriminate that is to parse out the sense of shame um, mm -hmm. from course that um, the sense of shame related self-stigma will endure over time. Where is that for depression may come and go in some sort of episodic way? The challenge that I have is there's a sense in which in which part of self-efficacy is taking responsibility and that, that it's not who I am. And one of the ways I'm going to show, you know, I, I was I had a substance use disorder and I did this thing that real what well, that was reflected in my disorder. And part of the way I demonstrate that it's not who I am, demonstrate to myself is that I make amends for it and take responsibility for it and say it is not, you know, that, that uh, say, yeah, and to, and to be very forthright in, you know, in addressing it. And th that's where I sort of feel like there's a, there's a, I go back and forth on it. That sounded way more brilliant before I said it than after I said it, but I hope that the point was communicated. I'd be glad to talk to you mm -hmm. and people in the mm -hmm. field. My, mm -hmm. my thought of it mm -hmm. is, this is partly a dominance of, of a very compelling 12-step approach mm -hmm. and that um, we realize good mental health is not solely re reduced to your sense of efficacy um, mm -hmm. and going back and undoing things, that there's a sense of your identity that exists separately from that, um, that um, as a cognitive behavior therapist, I'd always say distinguish uh, people's troubling behaviors from them. And so mm -hmm. that would be the thing here too. I don't think we want to equate uh, people who abuse substances as there's some of failures as a result of them. Yeah, th thank you. Great. Um, so our next question comes from, uh, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your name um, correctly, Aisha Hafiz, uh, who asks, should journalists avoid highlighting the mental illness struggles of perpetrators of violence, um, considering what you've uh, said about the stigma that is related to those kinds of reports. So if you're into that, one place you want to look at is the Carter Center. Um, Jimmy Carter, his wife, um, Rosalind, has been a, a big mental health advocate for the longest time. And they actually have a journalism um, fellowship um, to talk to journalists about how to talk about these kind of issues. Simply put, I think it's, I would have no problem with people saying the follow-up after these god-awful shootings and the degree to which a tied mental illness is probably the big flame that exacerbates stigma. Um, I actually ended up in NPR after the Denver shooting and the Connecticut shooting, saying what you see a lot of talking heads say, which is there's no direct connection to mental illness. Um, and that was unsatisfying because these horrible things people want an answer to. And so their answer in the past used to be tie it on to good and evil, which we don't have anymore. Um, I do think you see a big press, um, sorry for the double entendre, a big press in the media about um, trying to show a more balanced view of mental illness. The trouble is, as you know, in journalism, if it bleeds, it leads. And so some years back, the New York Times every Sunday on the front page had a person in recovery um, telling his or her story, and it's boring. And so it's harder to get press than these horrible things happen and the degree to which you try to try tie it back to their diagnosis. That's an, indeed a tricky question. And um, so let's see, I think um, the next should be David's uh, uh, follow-up question. And um, David Ennis um, seems to be very interested um, in uh, the stigma uh, measurement and um, uh, research. And so, uh, the question is, are levels of stigma and changes in level of stigma age correlated? 
Um, so um, I'm doing my, I'm pulling my mental books off the shelf and there has been a slew of research trying to tie stigma to demographics. And um, generally they do not find, uh, surprisingly for me, they do not find any connection between stigma and ethnicity. Stigma and gender, generally you find women who have a mental illness and were benignly viewed and the public who are women are less stigmatizing. Age, you would hope there's sort of reverse effect, um, inverse effect, that younger people are less stigmatizing. Um, I think to really capture that, you need a broad sample uh, in age, not a, not a uh, restricted range. Um, I know in our studies where we look just at adults, we have not seen it. Um, I, I think it would be interesting. I can tell you anecdotally, we have Honest Open Proud, uh, all versions, we have a college version of it, we have a high school version of it. And the high school version is a little bit reminiscent of what I started experiencing in the gay community, which is, you know, what's the deal? It's sort of who they are, get over it. And so there are a lot of people anecdotally in the high school thing that says, why are people giving us a hard time about this? Um, Again, that's sort of feedback from this limited sample, but I, I have this hope um, that it, it will go in that direction. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so the, the next question um, is tied to your comment about um, name changes and uh, the pros and cons of name changes. So Brittany uh, asks, does anyone have language they use that is not behavioral health when discussing mental health? Um, so uh, they said they run into people believing some actions are a chosen behavior because of uh, the uh, behavioral health uh, phrase versus an outward expression of a mental health condition. So, um, you know, I'm editor of Stigma and Health. And I've actually been second chair, or third chair of studies looking at different language. Um, and um, other than the heinous end of things, like calling somebody schizo or psycho, there is no consistent findings on whether what some words are better than others. Um, behavior health, I find a bit confusing until SAMHSA came along and said, this is what it is. I can tell you, I do a lot of public speaking on this, and depending where I'm at, I vacillate between behavioral health, mental health challenges, mental illness. Um, and your point about behavior health, if I understood it quite right, I've got blowback from that. Um, people say, you know, it's not a behavior. I'm not choosing to do this. Um, or other people say you're minimizing. It's a lot more than behavior. Um, Honest Open Proud actually has part of its first lesson on what do you call it? It's you for yourself. What do you call it? Because we want to respect that. Um, because I think you want to avoid word police. You don't all want to get in a fight with each other about what you're going to call it. Um, you can't get down to the real business of changing stigma. Great, thank you. Our next question uh, comes from Curtis McMillan. Uh, Curtis, do you want to uh, un unmute and ask a question yourself? Let me find Curtis on the list and he should be able to talk now. Okay, well, he can ask the question or comment uh, if you Sorry. want to read it. Xi Ying. Sorry, can you hear me, Keith? Yes. So my, my question is about um, people coming out uh, and proud with their substance abuse histories and the fact that um, epidemiological studies show that there's millions of Americans with substantial substance abuse histories who desisted that substance abuse on their own without professional intervention, without um, going to 12-step groups. Um, how does that complicate the, the, the coming out when the, the master narrative is that people with substance abuse problems should have been involved in those kinds of interventions? And is there a parallel with, with mental disorder of people coming out about their, their mental health challenges without having sought professional help? Um, thank you, Curtis. Um, I may be going the wrong way with this, but the whole point about um, I understand the literature is lots of people um, learn to live with or overcome their uh, substance use problem um, on their own. And so we would argue that's just the point. 
it's not all an issue of symptoms and failures and not being able to overcome things. People learn how to live with it. On the mental health side, um, one of the anecdotes about the mental health side is the whole idea of recovery and more optimistic views of mental illness did not come from the professions. The professions will still be based on this downhill course of Krapelin. It came from people with lived experience who said, we do recover, we do learn to live with it. Recovery is not necessarily, though there are a lot of people who do it, recovery is not necessarily being symptom-free. It's learning how to live with the symptoms to reach your goals. So that you're able to go through this without being in the treatment, um, if I understand your point right, is the point. That it's part of who you are and you go forward and do good. Yeah, I guess I can chime in and, uh, and say that uh, one thing about uh, talking about stigma and at least mental health um, is that, well, I mean, a lot of psychiatrists and uh, mental health professionals also talk about stigma, but when uh, some of them talk about stigma, they're talking about like, uh, they're impl uh, implying that, well, you are suffering from mental illness, you should be see seeking treatment, you, you should be uh, taking meds, etc., and 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 you're kind of not doing that, and so that's why you should you should be coming out and um, rec uh, acknowledging your mental illness uh, to that regard. But I, as I understand, this is not what you had uh, implying or uh, what a lot of people in the Matt Prime movement, uh, when they're talking about um, owning the identity is referring to. And, um, and there's, uh, there should be a wider degree of latitude in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, the relationship with medication, with treatment, et cetera. Yeah, so I have my thoughts about this a lot clearer in the mental health side, and you, you said it. Um, coming out is not an issue of being a better patient and telling people when you're ill and having a rough time. It's part of sharing who your identity is. It's part of sharing that despite continuing to have this, you can do fine. And I say this as a licensed clinical psychologist and somebody who's in the psychiatry department. Um, the, the most stigmatizing professions up to about 10 years ago um, we're talking about lawyers and plumbers and electricians. The most stigmatizing professions were psychiatrists and psychologists. And perhaps postdoc in the data, that's an example. They tend to see people where they're really sick and they tend to reduce it that way. But in terms of changing the stigma of mental illness, psychiatrists and psychologists have not been great champions. And you want people to speak for themselves with lived experience and say, this is the reality. Data does go ahead and support it. Um, people have been screaming about recovery for a long time and data, long-term follow-up data does support it. Um, but uh, yeah, I agree with you. The goals here is not how to ask for help better. No, mm -hmm. so asking for help is a good thing, but that's not the goal. Thanks. Um, so we have a little bit of time. I wondered if um, um, the audience still has other questions. Feel free to also raise your hand um, if you um, don't have to, the time to, to, to um, type in the question. Oh, why did I it raise with my own hand? <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to see who raised their hand. And that's, you know, that's the effect of coming back to, to, to the school year. Uh, you're all confused about how everything works. I don't see any raised hands, Ji Ying, if, if you have any additional comments or questions. Well, I guess I, I was just, uh, I was very much intrigued by your comment about how relapse of, uh, uh, I mean, whereas uh, substance use disorder um, is um, covered by the ADA, the relapse of it is not, right? So I wondered, um, what does it uh, tell us about the kind of cultural attitude about uh, substance use disorder and also maybe the disability rights circles attitude toward it? Um, my quick response is that um, people with substance use disorder are only okay after they abstain. And so if you're not able to abstain, you're still broken um, and therefore the law should protect you. Mm -hmm. 
So still, it, it's still very much a kind of outcome oriented. Um, yeah. Think of the irony. Um, if you relapse because of mental illness, um, your um, place of business still has to provide accommodations to you. Um, mm -hmm. Not true with with substance use disorder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, that just reminds us that even within the, the uh, community of people advocating for or working for disability rights, there is a lot of education to do in terms of understanding uh, substance use disorder and um, people uh, living with it as um, part of the community. So um, Harold has another question. Do you want me to? ask or do you, can, do you want to speak about it yourself? Okay, just uh, many of us are huge fans of Irving Goffman's book, Stigma. And I just wonder uh, if there's some other, by the way, one of the great works of game theory ever written, although there's not an equation in the entire book. The uh, Are there other works that you would recommend for those of us either in social work, mental health, public policy uh, around stigma that you think would be really valuable for us to learn from? So let me give you the prominent researchers. Um, Bruce Link um, probably goes back the longest. Um, he was at Columbia. He's now at um, UC Riverside. Um, he's a sociologist. Actually, a lot of um, some of the first good research on stigma were done by sociologists. Um, Bernice Pesco Solito, who is at Indiana University, um, who does big data epidemiologic studies who shows the stigma of, of uh, mental illness is getting worse. Um, um, Canada has a big program now and it's probably its 15th year to erase the stigma and somebody named Heather Stewart, S-T-U-A-R-T, um, leads that up and done some good stuff. Um, the World Psychiatric Association um, has matured um, I didn't like the way they originally started on this, has matured into a better view of anti-stigma. And Graham Thornicroft, um, who's in London, does good stuff on that. Um, I've written 20 books. Um, great book, if you're looking for a stocking stuffer, is um, The Stigma Effect, which came out by Columbia University Press, which is um, reviews unintended consequences of stigma change. And while the pandemic, we had nothing better to do, we edited a book on the stigma of substance use disorder, um, which is a uh, Shomerus, spelled S-C-H-O-M-E-R-U-S, tends to be the well-known researcher on uh, stigma and substance use disorder. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, so I guess we can, uh, wrap up here and thank you so much for uh, uh, Dr. Corrigan for your wonderful presentation today and um, it's a great way to uh, really uh, kickstart our um, school year and thank you all the audience for your um, questions and comments so um, like uh, Dr. Corrigan said if you have any questions feel free to reach out to him and um, we look forward to seeing you in the upcoming Michael Davis lectures so I guess with that I'll hand back to uh, uh, Keith and see if he has other comments. I have nothing more to add. Thank you, Drs. Corrigan and Ma, for this uh, insightful discussion and presentation. It's one of my favorites. Thanks see for you having me. Soon. Thank you. Thank you for attending. Thank you, Ying. Thank you.